Hey everybody, it's Jaren back with another word. This one is going to be a little bit different, so I want to just ask you guys to um, bear with me on this. Going to say a prayer and then I'm going to get started. Heavenly Father, I just come before you right now and I thank you for the opportunity to get back on here and speak what you've given to me. Lord, I ask that you would just settle on this video. I ask that you would settle in this atmosphere. Holy Spirit, I just invite you in and I ask that you would help me to be faithful to what you've given me and to not do any more and not do any less. God, I ask that you bring to mind the things that you want me to say. I ask that everybody who is listening to this message, I just pray that their hearts would be open to not want to fail the test, God. And I ask that those who have ears to hear may hear and those who have eyes to see may see God. And I ask that you would just have mercy on us and have grace, Lord, and give us your mind about these things and help us to actually see things the way you do. Um, from your perspective, Jesus. And so I just thank you for your corrections, however they may feel, however they may cut us. We need it, Lord, because we have a fierce enemy who is after us all the time. And I just thank you again, Jesus, in Jesus name. Amen. So before I get started, I want to tell you guys to remember this. The gates of hell will not prevail against the church. The Lord actually gave me this message almost two years ago. And so I've been waiting for a long time <laughs> to actually be able to give this word. And within the past month or so, the Lord has been really stressing this message more and more. And he was telling me the next message that I give needs to be this one. He had been bringing to mind when I was in high school, when I was taking AP European history, and we came upon midterms. My AP Euro teacher was amazing, awesome. I loved him so much. That was one of my favorite classes. And the day before the midterm, we actually went over all the answers to the midterm in class. And I was pretty confident about the midterm, but I remember the only part of the midterm that I was kind of nervous about were the questions that would center around the unification of Germany. Now, why do I remember that? Well, I was very good at understanding and remembering the things that my teacher would teach us in class but the only the only section of that entire class that I had trouble really remembering and understanding was when we discussed the unification of Germany because I wasn't in class that at that time I think I was sick but because I wasn't physically there to learn about it when I would catch up on the notes, it just didn't hit the same. It didn't click the same. And so I was really trying to pay attention to the answers that my teacher was giving us that would be on the midterm the next day, which included the unification of Germany, you know. Well, the next day we were taking the midterm and I remember I was... I started to put down the answers and all the answers were cut. Like each question that I would run up on, the answer was popping into my mind because I was remembering the exact answer from when our teacher told it to us the day before. So I was just marking off all the answers and I was one of the first ones to get done. And I was thinking to myself, ooh, did I do something wrong? Because I feel like... I feel like I shouldn't have gotten done so fast. And I remember when I was taking the midterm, there would be times where I would feel kind of like tempted to, to 
choose the answer that I thought it would be and try to figure out the answers for myself because I kind of low-key felt like I was cheating because the answers were coming to my mind. I definitely was not the smartest student in that class. There were students that were much, who were much smarter than me in there. Well, when my teacher got done grading the midterms he's like okay you know the grading is complete there's only one person who got a 100 and that's jaren and i was like <laughs> what <laughs> how could i have gotten a 100 and nobody else like this is so strange and and whenever that would come to mind i would just think about how strange it was that i was the only one that got a 100 and he felt the need to like comment on it. Like I'm thinking to myself, well, you gave us the answers. <laughs> I thought everybody would have gotten a 100, you know, you gave us the answers literally the day before. I was just kind of like asking, I was like, Holy Spirit, like what, <laughs> why, why was I the only one to get a 100? And the Holy Spirit just, um, you know, at the time, I thought, I just kind of chalked it up to, to, well, yeah, I have photographic memory. So that's just why I was able to remember all that stuff. But it was literally the Holy Spirit feeding me the answers. <laughs> we were just doing the test together. But, but the reason why I was able to get a 100, the reason why I was carefully going with the answers that were popping into my mind that I saw was because I knew that even though I could spend time trying to figure out for myself what the answers are, I know that I already had the answers. So I just, I did what my teacher told me to do. Okay. I went with the answers that my teacher gave me. Okay. And those specific questions, the ones regarding the unification of Germany, I aced those too because I went with the answers that my teacher gave me. <laughs> I didn't try to figure it out for myself. I didn't, even though I knew most of the answers already, I didn't try to lean to my own understanding. And at this point, I'm sure you know where I'm going with this, okay? The Lord is bringing this up because he wants us to understand that he does not want us to fail the test. And if you've been a Christian for any amount of time, you hopefully have realized by now that we get tested a lot, okay? Satan is setting traps for us on a regular basis. And it's important for us to stay close to the Lord and actually cry out for wisdom and understanding because Satan is very sneaky and we are not smart enough on our own to face him. And you would think with all the resources that we have available to us to be able to pass these tests, you would think that we would be okay, but there are so many who will fail the test. That's a prophecy written in the Bible. You know, the test is open book, okay? The teacher gave us the answers. Jesus has given us the answers. He gave us peers to help us during the tests, okay? He gave us apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists, and, and many more spiritual gifts to help us to edify, encourage, teach, correct, rebuke one another. But we still, some of us still fail the test. And at this point, it's like, did you even want to pass? But nobody fails a test on purpose. They're deceived into failing. Well, you might think, how do I keep myself from being deceived? There's a scripture in Mark chapter 8, verse 15. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of Herod. The leaven that Jesus is referring to in this scripture is unbelief and hypocrisy. These kinds of things, really unbelief. Unbelief is so dangerous. The same way that a little bit of yeast can leaven the entire batch of dough. A little bit of unbelief is so dangerous because it can spread and multiply itself, okay? And this is very, very dangerous. Unbelief needs to be dealt with with extreme prejudice, okay? The same way like, okay, so imagine you are in, uh, you're out in public. Imagine if somebody just walks up to you and just starts coughing, but isn't covering their mouth. 
Okay, like <laughs> you're gonna be like, get away from me. You need to cover your mouth or get away from me. Okay, um, that's the same thing. Like some of some people out here are not covering their mouths. Okay, even down to the offerings you're giving. You know, there have been times when people would sow money into me in this ministry and the Lord would tell me to send it back because it was a seed not given in faith. You may think that you are just sending money to help me, but you're giving seeds. You're sowing seeds and the Lord is not going to accept seeds of unbelief no matter how much I may need them. You know what I'm saying? You might notice that any leader or really any any person that you hang around a lot, you spend a lot of time around, you spend a lot of time watching, you might notice yourself talking like them. You might notice yourself thinking the way that they do, following their example, whether you realize it or not. There are times where I've gotten around prophetic people and God has used them to sharpen my gift. People have gotten around me and noticed that their gifts have been getting stronger in certain areas. There are certain people who I'll watch and I notice that I can feel certain gifts within me being strengthened, being fanned into flames. This is partly the way that I'm able to tell that they are sent from God. I know them by their fruits. And alternatively, people who are not sent from God or people who are sharing messages that are not from God. There's there's like this there's this tug or they're they're speaking to me in everyday life um trying to get me to come into agreement with whatever it is that they're saying or whatever, you know. There's this tug, you know, where um it's it's like um I can feel something trying to get me to conform to it. And I'm like, (laughs) I don't, but, but I'm, but my spirit is resisting it. Like, I'm like, I don't want, I don't want to, to, I don't want my thought patterns to be this way. Now I'm like fighting with it in my mind and I have to ask the Lord, okay, what is this? What spirit is this? What is, what is trying to get me to come into agreement with it? You know? Um, and then when I, when I spend some time with the Lord and I take this person to the Lord, the Lord can either tell me, yes, they're from me. You know, your flesh just doesn't want to hear it or no, they're not from me. And this is the spirit that is trying to attach itself to you. So that's partly what the Lord means when he says, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of Herod, the leaven of the Pharisees was unbelief, but there is leaven in certain leaders that the Lord wants you to be wary of as well. You know, there's another scripture that I want to share with you guys. It is second Timothy chapter four verses three and four for a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They will reject the truth and chase after myths. We are in an age where there are just, there's so many things pulling at us, so many ways that Satan is trying to deceive us. And we sometimes read this scripture and we look at the obvious things, you know, we look at the obvious things that Satan is using to deceive people like new age deceptions and, you know, these, these motivational speakers and, you know, these, um, people who are clearly not leading anybody to Jesus. We look at those things and we, we think that's like the obvious thing. Um, we take this scripture and we apply it to what we think and what we assume is what Paul is talking about. But what is Paul really talking about? We don't take the further steps and ask the Lord what he means by this. What does this actually look like? And again, the Lord is warning us, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of Herod. Unbelief. You know, if you want to know how to not be deceived in these last days, in these end times, you know, you have to look at how am I being deceived now? How can I gird up myself in truth so that we, if we are still alive, when the false prophet and the, the, the beast come, how can we stand against him? And your preparation to stand against him starts as soon as you can prepare, <laughs> to be honest, because 
the inability to withstand wholesome and sound doctrine is not just in the ballpark of new age deception and motivational teachers and you know worldly lusts and things of that nature it's messages and and doctrines and belief systems that pander to our own pride and our own self-righteousness the church is in desperate need for spiritual maturity because I cannot tell you how many times I'll get people saying to me, yeah, I, I prefer this teacher or this teacher or this teacher because they keep it real. They, they teach sound doctrine, but we're still not getting it because these teachers that we all love and brag about are working for Christ. <laughs> It's Christ who we should be boasting in, okay? And this is the same thing that the Corinthians were doing. They were bragging about, oh, well, I follow Apollo, and but me, I follow Paul. And, you know, um, others would be like, well, I follow Christ, you know? And it would just be all this confusion about who, who, who they follow. And Paul was telling them, you guys are missing the point. <laughs> it's about Jesus. It's not about so somebody, one person might plant the seed, the other person may water it, the other person may harvest it. But all of the workers come from Christ. We we tend to read scriptures and we tend to not see ourselves. <laughs> we see them. We always it's always them, you know? And that's the same thing that the Pharisees were dealing with, that that was part of the leaven of the Pharisees. So in order to really understand the deceptions that are swirling now and even the coming deceptions, we have to understand, okay, let's look at the first deception. And we look at what happened in the garden with Adam and Eve and how the serpent tricked and deceived Eve. He played on her pride. Pride is what we need to be on the lookout for because at the root, at the base of every single sin is pride. God gave them, gave both of them a directive. Do not eat from this tree. And here comes Satan. You don't need to eat from you. That's not what he meant. He didn't mean that, right? And Because Eve leaned to her own understanding, here we are. With understanding pride, there's so much of the body of Christ who miscategorizes pride and humility in the first place. There's so many of us who look at boasting in Christ and boasting in self and conflate the two. We think they're the same thing. And we don't know how to discern the difference between those two. And so we start attacking people who are truly following Jesus and truly doing what Jesus is asking us to do. And we coddle the ones who are actually walking in pride. We really need to learn how to nail down how God actually views pride and how God actually views humility. Because if you keep leaning to your own understanding regarding these things, you're gonna keep getting deceived. We really, really need wisdom and understanding, okay? We need to cry out for it. And this is something that God has offered to us for free. Scripture says that by wisdom, the Lord founded the earth and by understanding, he created the heavens. The Lord tells us in scripture, we can ask him for this same wisdom, right? And he'll give, he'll give it to us freely, but we still choose to lean to our own understanding. Like at this point, it's almost as if we're asking to be deceived. We can look at the story of Job and see what happened to him and see how his friends were. His friends were not bad people, you guys. They were really good friends. But the problem is they took what was normally true about God and they took what was normally true about someone in Job's situation and they used it to apply it to Job's situation. And they used it to encourage Job. They said some out-of-pocket stuff. One of them was like, yeah, your your children probably deserved it. What? (laughs) 
That's outrageous. That is outrageous, okay? But it, it is our own self-righteousness that can trick us into saying some of the wildest things, you know? And at the end of the book, the Lord tells Job's friends, I'm angry with you and your friends because you did not speak accurately about me. Job is the only one who spoke accurately about me. And what was it that Job spoke that was accurate about the Lord? The fact that wisdom and understanding belong to the Lord. And it is wise for you to keep your mouth shut about a certain situation until the Lord gives you revelation about what is going on in that particular situation. There are so many things that are evil that look good and things that are actually good and from God that look like they might be evil. And you need the wisdom of the Holy Spirit to be able to distinguish between the two. Don't be deceived, okay? We look at the Bible and we know that God is good because the Bible tells us he's good, right? We know that that the villains in the Bible are the villains because we're told they're the villains. We know the good guys are the good guys because we're told they're the good guys. But the time is already here when we need to press in deep we need to know the Lord's voice for ourselves so that we can understand just why were these guys the good guys and why were these guys the bad guys because when you really examine the stuff that God would do in scripture and you take yourself outside of the situation of you already knowing what's right and wrong in scripture you could look at that and and think take it at face value and think man God, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, the fact that the fact that God sent his very own son to die brutally on the cross for us. He sent his own son to die on the cross, a brutal death to be rejected by his own people. The scripture even says that it pleased the Lord to allow Jesus to die for us. Like what? And so when we look at Peter and we see Peter getting rebuked for telling Jesus, no, I, you're not, this should never happen to you. You dying? No. He spoke something any normal person would assume was the right thing to say, because why would it be a good thing for at, in his shoes? Why would it be a good thing for my rabbi to die brutally what that should never happen right no but jesus had to call him out no you are a stumbling block to me that's what he that's what he said and he even he said get thee behind me satan you are a stumbling block to me because you are looking at things from a human standpoint and not from god's beware of the leaven of the pharisees and of herod it is very easy to look at scripture and think, oh, I wouldn't have done that. But when you really use scripture as a mirror, you have enough maturity to say, actually, I might. I might have done that. That might have been me. That could have been me. And thank God that it doesn't have to be us because we have the playbook. We have the cheat codes, but we throw them away for our own understanding, for our own perception of what is true and what is not true even the pharisees even the pharisees said to themselves that they would never have persecuted the prophets the way that ancient israel did but jesus told them in matthew 23 let's go to it what sorrow awaits you teachers of religious law and you pharisees you hypocrites you build tombs for the prophets your ancestors killed and you decorate the monuments of the godly people your ancestors destroyed then you say if we had lived in the days of our ancestors we would never have joined them in killing the prophets but in saying that you actually testify against yourselves that you are indeed the descendants of those who murdered the prophets go ahead and finish what your ancestors started snakes sons of vipers how will you escape the judgment of hell 
Therefore, I'm sending you prophets and wise men and teachers of the religious law. You will kill some by crucifixion and you will flog others with whips in your synagogues, chasing them from city to city. As a result, you will be held responsible for the murder of all godly people of all time, from the murder of righteous Abel to the murder of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you killed in the temple between the sanctuary and the altar. I tell you the truth, this judgment will fall on this very generation. So you see in scripture how the Pharisees looked at their ancestors and said, I would have never done that. And I'm sure those ancestors may have looked at the Israelites in the wilderness and thought, I would have never treated Moses like that. But nope, because when the the Israelites in the wilderness were rebelling against Moses and Aaron, God used Aaron's staff to produce a miracle of the budding uh, almond blossoms and even the ripened fruit and the almonds, you know. And so God took a dead stick that wasn't attached to anything and produced life on it, like the entire life cycle of the almond. That's what he did. And the the Israelites in the wilderness, they had enough sense to look at that and tremble in fear because they realized that they were rebelling against someone who the Lord had chosen. And as spiritually dull as they were, they are going to be better off on judgment day than many of the Christians in the last days because they had the eyes to see and the ears to hear when the Lord was moving in the lives of people he had chosen. And the Lord tells us in the last days that you'll be able to distinguish the ones who are truly sent by God and ones who are not by their fruit. What kind of fruit are they producing? What kind of fruit are their ministries producing? God shows us all the time fruit on people's ministries. In my own ministry, I am in a seemingly dead situation by going from Airbnb to Airbnb with no end in sight. Yet I keep encountering people everywhere I go and God transforms their lives. They give their hearts to Jesus. God does incredible miracles from right where I am, even though it looks like Things in my life are dead because I'm connected to the vine and you need to be looking and seeing, is this person connected to the vine? Are they connected to Jesus? What kind of spiritual fruit do they operate in? Do not allow the people of the past to testify against you. Listen to the Lord's voice while he's calling, while he's near. It is so easy to look at all these technological advancements that we make in each generation fools us into thinking that we are better than the last generation but we still all have the same sin nature and as long as we all have the same sin nature we are susceptible to making the same stupid mistakes as the people who came before us and if you don't know jesus intricately enough to see when he's moving without somebody telling you oh yeah this is jesus moving you need to be able to discern him for yourself and you need to be able to act on the discernment that he gives you. And I'll give you a hint. You saying, oh, this just doesn't sit right in my spirit. That is not discernment. (laughs) There are many things that don't sit right in my spirit that are of God. It's just my flesh not wanting to yield to what the Lord wants me to do in that moment. Some things you have to sit with, some things you have to take to the Lord, actually act like you have a relationship with the Lord that you say you have. We need maturity. True maturity comes from what you do with what you've been taught. How much fruit are you bearing? Many of us know so much about God. We are so full with the word of God, but we are lacking in application. We look like Raygun in the spirit, okay? The Australian woman at the Olympics who is has a a PhD in like break dancing or something is like a professor and everything. But when she went to the Olympics and had to perform, she looked really bad. And a lot of us look like that. Our heads do not need to be so big that all we have is knowledge. And all we do is we continue to just amass knowledge and have no execution. We need to have the fear of the Lord. That is the beginning of wisdom. We need the fear of the Lord to be able to make it in these times. We need to have enough humility to know that we don't have all the answers. Jesus does. And he gives us the answers. Okay. Just like 
I told you at the beginning of this video how in high school I went with the answers that my teacher gave me and I didn't try to waste time by figuring it out myself. You know, there's a reason that Satan deals in darkness and hiding and, and deception and trickery, okay? It's because he cannot face a true child of God in the light. He's a coward. He has to look like something noble and good and something that gives us comfort. So he has to masquerade as an angel of light. And so every chance you get, you need to drag him into the light. The scripture says to not take any parts in the works of darkness, but to expose them. So Lord, may every person listening to this message, may every person who's still here, may you give them the eyes to see. May you give them the ability to be able to see. May you allow them to be more dependent upon you and your spirit and your voice, Jesus. Not by power, not by might, but by your spirit, Lord. Will any of us be able to make it into the kingdom of God? And I ask that everybody who is listening to this message would make it into the kingdom of God. And if any of them needs to repent, Lord, I ask that you would just tug on their hearts, God. And I ask that they may not harden their heart against you. May they not harden their hearts as the Israelites did in the wilderness, Lord. May they turn back to you and live. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, everybody who is still here. God willing, this will not be the last message about this. There's still a few things that the Lord wants to hammer out. And so, God willing, whenever the Lord brings me back on here, I will be here with another message. Okay, bye, everybody.